everybody. Um, Shelley Bonus and Scott Roberts here. And uh, today's um, uh, show is the Mount Wilson Experience about uh, uh, Milton. What's his middle name, Shelley? LaSalle. LaSalle. LaSalle Hummison. Hummison, right? Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll let you take it from here, Shelley. Well, you know, Milton LaSalle Hummison is my hero. And his story is quite unusual. He began as, um, well, he only had an eighth grade education. And his parents used to take him up to Mount Wilson. Mount Wilson used to be kind of a vacation destination for people to go camping, poorer families, uh, at the turn of the 20th century. And Hummison fell in love with the mountain. And so when he was in the eighth grade, he quit school. Wow. And he basically, um, among other things, uh, applied for a job as uh, a mule skitter. And he was one of the people who brought... Probably one uh, of the few jobs you could get. I mean, you're going to do labor or something if you're going to quit school that early. So Yeah, right? and, he, um, and he was one of the people that... Uh, actually, he started in 1915. And he uh, worked as a mule skinner for the pack trains that traveled from Sierra Madre up to Mount Wilson and brought the equipment up to Mount Wilson. There was no road coming up to Mount Wilson. Wow. You know, I, love, I love to tell people who come up to observe now how incredible it is, and especially now the Angeles Crest Highway is really beautiful, the streets are beautiful, the drive is beautiful. But, you know, George Ellery Hale and the people that first came up there, they were serious pioneers, there were no roads. And all of this incredible equipment that is still there today, including the steel for the domes and everything, came up on the back of mules. Oh, wow. For the most part. Um, they tried, actually, to design a, um, a Mack truck, an electric truck, to bring some of the equipment up. I thought and I saw a photograph of an old type of truck. So maybe yeah, there was a publicity photo. <laughs> truck couldn't carry the telescope so mules had to pull the truck ah it, it was amazing <laughs> so these, it twice as hard <laughs> yeah yeah but these were these were incredibly courageous and determined people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and so um milton hummison for me is one of the most interesting uh characters and astronomers that ever came on the mountain uh so he came up um as as a mule as a mule skinner and um, it was listed actually in the annual observatory report by Hale that a few, four mule team was driven, driven by a good teams, teamster. And that teamster um, consisted of the head man and three skilled men. And a good teamster meant uh, a, a person with colorful vocabulary um, that knew how to get mules to move up the mountain. And it I wasn't see. just going, you know? <laughs> Come on, let's go, mules. Come on, come on, come, come on. on. we got to pull the tons of equipment up Mount Wilson. So, yeah. so the reference to the truck um, that uh, indicated it's a primitive state for the development in the time of Sierra Madre Trail uh, mm -hmm. approached the summit. Um, it ran along the side of Mount Harvard across a very deep canyon from the Hale Lab and Carnegie Observatories and the living quarters um, on Mount Wilson. Mm -hmm. uh, the pack train could be seen from there and um, a good driver could actually be heard. So it was a little bit more than, come on little donkey, come on. Okay. You know, so that was a very colorful part wow. of the mountain. Cool. Um, but Milton Hummison, was uh, incredible at everything he did. He was, he had in great integrity, perhaps because he didn't have the finer education that other people on the mountain had. But he had something else. He had a big heart. And he was a young man, and he fell in love with the Mount Wilson electrician's daughter. Oh, wow. And so the Mount Wilson electrician at that time, his name was Jerry Dowd, and he had designed and installed much of the electrical equipment that was on the Mount, on Mount Wilson at that time. Okay. And Hummison really loved his daughter, and Jerry Dowd was fond of Hummison. 
So basically, he told Hamasin, look, I know you're fond of my daughter, but you need a better job than being a mule skitter. Ah, okay. So, <laughs> so he actually uh, was uh, recommended for the job of janitor on the mountain. He took the job, he married Jerry Dowd's daughter, Helen Dowd, and um, he was more socially acceptable uh, being the janitor. And um, that was a job that opened the universe. I would say being a janitor was the job that opened the universe. I like that, because I used to be a janitor. So I, I have a similar background, although I did go past eighth grade, so. But the thing that's so incredible is when you start like that, you know, you do things to perfection. You're so interested. It's not your, it's not your bag of tricks, and so you're you're more perfect sometimes than somebody that would just take it for granted what they did. That's how he was. He was he was a perfectionist, basically, um, uh, at everything he did. And in 1917, so he was, he started 1915 driving the mules up there, and in 1917, with the support of Jerry Dowd, his then father-in-law. Hummison uh, became, officially became the janitor, and he worked as a janitor from 1917 to 1918. And they, he had a son, actually, named William, who eventually became the janitor of Mount Wilson. Okay, but I'm going to cut to the chase. The son became <laughs> the janitor, a, but... The cycle of, of uh, yeah, cosmic life but that's Milton going on. Hummison, Milton wow. Hummison, and hang in there for this, it's amazing. Yeah. Milton Hummison who was a mule skinner, who only had an eighth grade education, eventually became the director of Mount Wilson. Wow. So this is a tale. We're not going to be able to tell the whole tale today. But yeah, this yeah, 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 yeah. So um, now you have, you have some, uh, you, you uh, have a PowerPoint presentation, which I'm going to go through some of these slides and, and uh, we'll discuss okay. them. But uh, uh, you give this presentation on cruise ships that go around the world, right? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, um, I lecture uh, to all kinds of different audiences, from professional astronomers to the general public, mm -hmm. you know, because I see myself as a science translator. Mm -hmm. And we're in such exciting time now, you know, people all over the world are really interested in what's going on on the planet and what's going on above it, you know? Right. They're right. starting to get the fact that we're all one. And so yes. this is a very exciting time. Right. And um, yeah, so the audiences are big, the cruise ships are big, you know, they're like sometimes 1,500 people in the theater. Awesome. And you try to talk to people, not at people, and they're on a cruise and it's interesting because um, a lot of times think, oh, you're giving astronomy or cosmology lecture. You know, it's not like you're out on deck with a laser pointer, which is part of it sometimes. Yes. You know? But the skies right. at sea are not always uh, so clear. You know, so um, the lectures are great. And what I do do, which I love doing, is on most of the ships I do Shelley's You Can Sleep When You're Dead pajama party. Get up and see the movie. <laughs> So I have you people, can sleep you know, when you're dead, okay. Yeah, yeah, wake up, you know, I mean, it's, you know, so I always do it when we have a waning moon, because yeah. usually right before sunrise, the sky is clear enough, so you can see the moon, and then I teach people, of course, how to find where the sun will rise based on where the moon is lit, you know, right. and if I'm, and you know, they gamble on ships, so it's not real gambling what I do, but I do usually bring like a protractor and say, okay, give me the angle. That measure, where's the angle that the, that the sun will rise on the horizon? You know? Oh, wow. So it's a lot, it's a lot of fun. Oh, that's and cool. You turn them the into time, astronomers, or at least navigators, so. Yeah, navigators, yeah. celestial navigation. Most of the time, people actually will come up in their pajamas. And a lot of times, I'll have somebody say, but I don't sleep in pajamas. <laughs> Which is <laughs> you. Like, come up as you please, you know. So it's, it's a biology lesson too. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Hopefully they but don't come commando. Okay. So. Do you have a slide or where where are we? Okay. So let, let's let's switch the screen here to um, your uh, your Part presentation of the PowerPoint. and and what we're on right now is uh, this first slide, um, which uh, shows 
it shows you it shows I mean it's a beautiful collage it's got uh, it's got you up on the ladder, it looks like on the 60 inch or the 100. Yes, that's the 60 inch. Yeah. Yes, right? yes. And then a bunch of people kind of mm -hmm. looking over your shoulder at the computer. Yeah, those, uh, people, people, those people are my students. Uh, for 25 years, I taught uh, astronomy, cosmology, and space exploration at UCLA Extension. And part of the class was to have the students come up and look through the 60 inch telescopes. Very cool. Which was pretty, pretty thrilling. thrilling. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then we've got, yeah. uh, you know, it looks like, yeah, it's a 60 inch uh, poking through the dome there. And, and Mount Wilson just like uh, covered in snow. It looks like a fairyland, you know. And then you have an image of, in this collage of the scale uh, of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and uh, Einstein looking through the eyepiece here, and a picture of you. Uh, studying the screen there, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what's well, really what's great about, about um, you know, the 60-inch you know, is, is the telescope that Harlow Shapley used, used, basically between 1908 and 1919, to determine uh, where uh, the where sun, the sun is, is, where the solar system, system is, within the Milky Way, mm -hmm. when we still well, thought, thought the Milky Way was the universe. Was the universe. Right. So, so, pretty incredible, incredible, you know. Pretty incredible. And, and, Pretty incredible. And you know, it's magnificent. The dome is magnificent. The telescope is magnificent. The acoustics in the dome are magnificent. And there's nothing like having an observing session in the 60 inch and having somebody play acoustic guitar. You know, can you imagine? It's oh, yeah. Now, Shelly, you worked at a uh, session director for how many years there? How long? Oh, almost, almost, almost 25 years. 25 yeah. years, wow. So yeah. you know a lot of yeah. history yeah. here. So yeah. uh, you, the title of your presentation is Hubble and Hummison, the Odd Couple of the Cosmos. Uh, yes. And uh, so that's, that's, that's great. And uh, let me make sure I'm not uh, zooming out too far here. So, 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 so the, the big, big discovery, discovery, you know, I mean, there's many discoveries that were made at Mount Wilson, you know, including, including Hale's great discoveries of the magnetic fields of the sun, sun you, know. you know. But, right. um, uh, the first major, I think, contribution was the fact that um, Chaplin was able to determine where the sun is within the galaxy. And then, um, when Hubble came up and started to use the 100-inch uh, between 19, I think, 1919 and, 19, and um, 1925, I think he wrote the paper in 29, Mm -hmm. uh, Hubble and Hummison together uh, were able to determine, not by theory, but by observation and spectra, yes. that the Milky Way was only one of billions of what Hubble called uh, spiral nebula. He did not call galaxies galaxies. That um, um, irritated Shapley greatly. Shapley called the galaxy just to make a couple angry, angry, but the IAU, I think, did actually officially call these spiral nebula galaxies, galaxies until after Hubble passed away in 1953. I'm, I'm not, not sure, sure, but. Oh, yeah. Lord. Huh. Yeah, kind of I didn't realize, I didn't realize so, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, so um, if, if you can go to the next slide, can we go to the red or the faster? We're there right now. Okay, so this is kind of like my mantra to remember what we're talking about when we're talking about the expansion of the universe. Not what's making it expand, which we call dark energy, you know, um, dark energy is a repulsive force, we don't really know what it is, I used to think it was my ex-boyfriend, but, um, <laughs> Also, okay, but the point is that if you can remember this, you get a concept of what we're looking at. We're looking at at the the rigid at the at the expanding wavelength. And so we say the redder the wavelength, the faster the faster the farther away the object is that we're looking. The farther away it is, the fainter it appears. Right. And, and the fainter it appears, we think the older it is. And, and that has led us to, at this point, I mean, of course, there's controversy about it, but that has led us to think that um, the universe is, at this time, uh, 13.8 billion years old. 
but, but you, you know, know there's, there's a controversy, controversy about the actual Hubble constant, constant and, you know, are these measurements, measurements correct? correct? We, we might, might not have the measurements, measurements correct, correct yet, yet, technology will tell us it, but the concept seems, seems to be right. right. And, and that, that discovery was made at the Mount Wilson Observatory, and Milton Huffison was the person that took most of the photographic plates and the spectra for Hubble. So uh, okay. it was pretty spectacular, um, In including including the famous 1923 yep, yep. image, the the one with yes, the yes, that's that's that's, 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 that's Thomason. Yes, you'll see it. I'm sorry, I don't have that picture here because you'll see if you look at the plate, you know, yeah. that there is an N on it, which which the stand stood for nebula, and that's crossed out, and it says you know uh, variable. Right. Because, because they realized, realized that it wasn't a nebula, nebula, it was actually a septic variable that they found that because the septic variable, they knew the period of a septic variable, right? right. right. A very consistent period. period. They yes. could tell yes. by yes. how bright it got and how dim it got, how far away it was, and determined it was, it was not in the Milky Way. Hmm. And that what was... A that must have been so amazing and so exciting to be there at that time because it's like... They've un they've ripped off um, the the lid off Pandora's box at this point. So yeah, yeah. Now yeah, uh, I moved on to the next slide. This is uh, uh, this is um, um, Hubble and uh, on the left and 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 Humison on to the right. Humison looks like yeah. a nice guy. Well, well it seems that Humison was everybody's friend. friend. He, he was, was a man's man, man and he, he was, was a um, he, 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 was, he was so determined to do well, and so honest, you know, that he worked harder and more than anybody at what he did. He, he, he loved, he absolutely loved being up there. And, um, and the thing that is amazing is he was so astute that even as a janitor, when he would have to clean up the dark room after the astronomers would process their plates, yeah. He, he would, would go, go by, by what, what, who left what, what mess, which astronomer, astronomer was in the dark room. room. And, and there was <laughs> one astronomer, I mean, it was a culture, you know, it was a culture, very sure. interesting. There was one astronomer that was not um, the kindest person. And he always had a demand that for midnight supper, uh, which was when you had the break, he had his eggs and toast a certain way, and he must have his tea. And he used to order Hudson around in a not very nice way. So Hudson got him his eggs, you know, there was a cook, but got him his eggs and his toast. And right. for about a week, he made his tea with the same tea bag. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know these are people. They were people, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, Hopefully not yeah, spitting so on the eggs, huh? Yeah, a self-educated uh, eighth grade dropout, he discovered, along with Hubble, that nearly all of the galaxies are moving away from us and from one another in high speeds, and that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it is receding uh, from yeah. us, the faster it is receding, the fainter it is, the fainter it is, the older we think the universe is. So, so cool. yeah. Very cool. yeah, and that was the beginning of... Pardon me? Pardon me? Uh, uh, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, we can go the next slide. Yeah, yeah we're, we're again looking at this beautiful snowy scene of Mount Wilson. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, it says here, here uh, I'm trying to see. At the age of 14, and just as George Hillary Hale was starting at the observatory, uh, Milton Huston's Hus Hus family, that's when he was 14, not 15, they used to take him up to the mountain to go camping. And at 15 is when he decided he was no longer going to go to school. And he became the, the mule skitter on the mountain. And uh, let's go to the next slide if we can. Yeah. Okay, all right, so here we yeah. go. Oh yeah, this looks like a vintage uh, picture, and it's just, uh, yeah, it's a bunch of um, uh, mules coming up, carrying uh, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah okay, so, so, so that's, that's the big thing, thing right? right? Remember what they said, when you come up to Mount Wilson, 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 you know, it's, it's the greatest thing, thing for you to come up, up you know, like early, so you get, get there, there, usually we, we plan the sessions so, so that you arrive at sunset. sunset. And, and when, when you, you drive up the Angeles Crest Highway, first of all, it's beautiful, but then, oh, the 
feeling you're going to have, the respect you have, will have for the original pioneers who settled that mountain with these huge telescopes because there was no road. Right. You know? And it's, it's just incredible, you know. So, um, yes, he would drive up, um, and um, they said that, you know, he was a very colorful character. That's how they used to refer to him. And, um, at the Sierra Madre Trail approach the summit, like I said, it ran alongside of Mount Harbor, across the Dean Canyon, uh, from the laboratory down in Pasadena, uh, up to the living quarters, which we call the monastery. And uh, we'll, one day we'll do a talk about why the living quarters were called the monastery, and um, why there were no women on the staff as Mount Wilson astronomers until officially on the staff until 1967. But there were a lot of really great astronomers that were allowed to observe uh, at Mount Wilson, but not on the staff. So, so Let's see. Um, yeah, so this is an interesting story. I want to read it. So, in 1917, with the support of, of Jerry Dowd, and when Hubbard actually became the, uh, the janitor, uh, there was a young uh, student, a seismologist from Caltech, named Hugo Video, and uh, he was volunteering up on the mountain, and uh, he saw that what Hummison was doing, uh, Hummison, he was taking uh, plates of the variable stars in Sagittarius with a 10-inch astrographic camera. And Hummison became so interested in the work that Bibi was doing, he watched him like a hawk, and he learned how to handle the photographic plates so very well that um, when... Uh, when, when, Bidio, Bidio, uh, when, when the season, season was over, yeah. uh, Bidio Bidio actually, actually um, recommended that Hudson take over his job, job. and he recommended him to George Dillery Hale. Hale. Wow. Hale was registered at the beginning because, of course, Hudson did not have a formal education, but eventually Hale agreed, and um, with, with knowledge that the 100 inch telescope, telescope was about to come into operation for the first time, Hummison actually was able to put himself in line to become the relief night assistant, first on the 60 inch, I see. and then eventually on the 100 inch. So Hummison's name actually first appeared as an employee, official employee of the observatory in 1918. And um, after, um, after convincing Hale that he was capable of doing this work, um, Shapley also took a liking to Hummus. And, um, and Shapley took Hummus under his wing and saw how great he was at um, observing, you know, processing things and cleaning up the dark room that he also suggested that Hummison be made a member of the scientific staff. Oh, wow. Because of the kind of plates and spectra that he was taking. So here, to be clear, it is that from his experience as a janitor and an night assistant, he knew uh, some of the less imperfect observers who were messy in their photography. Uh, in one case, um, the guy that he couldn't stand because he splashed hypo all over the, all over the dark room and stuff. That's, That's the, the one, one who we made the tea for out of the same tea bag for a week. Okay. Uh, so he was a character. He was a character, yeah. but had, he had a lot of um, a lot of humor. But as Hudson gained more experience, uh, he eventually took place for all of Shapley. And that was the beginning of something incredible for astronomy because he was such a perfectionist and such a great uh, photographer that Shapley recommended to Hale and to Adams that Hummison be appointed on the scientific staff. And the first um, entry of Hummison as a member of the scientific staff uh, was in August of 1920. 1920. So Shelley, this, this, I'll, I'll segue here for a second because yeah. During this time, they're they're photographing on on glass plates. Okay. Ten by ten, mostly ten, ten by ten inch glass plates. plates. Yes. Okay. All right. So, and the sensitivity of this film is really low. 
really low. So these exposures are hours long, right? Yes. And, and we're not yes. talking, yes. there's no tracking and stacking like no. astrophotographers no. can do today. Um, and, and most people doing digital astrophotography today understand that, yeah, there was a once upon a time they shot on film. They must have really sensitive film, but not then. Okay, not then. No. The, this and, this and film was extraordinarily slow, and and it took them. They had to. They had to guide right? the telescope out of the track because of the slight periodic error. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it was physically yeah. grueling. grueling. I, I mean, you, you had, had to be strong to get in the night with, with his, his body, body, body leaning up, up against the telescope as the guiding you know what I mean? and the yeah. and the astronomer up at the observing position. And this was really. Really, really hard, hard work, work and it's freezing cold. cold. Yeah. Right? right. And so I just what are they wearing? Them. Are they wearing? Well, well they, were they were a lot. They were a They tried to um, give them uh, some suits that I think it was Japanese pilots had worn, you know, that were insulated uh, to be worn electrically. But sometimes, you know, they could depend on that, so they just, they just knew how to bear it. You know? Wow. So this is, you're, you're out in the freezing cold. Uh, you're 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 guiding constantly because you can't go. Hey, I'm going to get a cup of coffee, or I need to go to the bathroom, or something. Shapley actually wrote. Um, Shapley went when Shapley went to Harvard. He wrote yes. something they called the Harvard Follies, and he wrote a song to the tune of uh, Gilbert Sullivan, one of Gilbert Sullivan's songs. And it was about, for an astronomer, how his neck would bend, his eye would curl, the absolute contortion that an astronomer would go through to be able to get an image on a plate. You know? so, so, so these professional, these, these other astronomers are probably so grateful that Hummison could do such fine work and they're going, yes, yes. I don't have to do it. I'll let Hummison do it, okay? Yeah, yeah, and I'll yeah, go back yeah. to my, uh, my fireplace <laughs> and my brandy and uh, my, my intellectual uh, conversations and, uh, and I'll wait for the data to come in, okay? Yep. Wow, okay. Kind yeah. of like and, that. And so yeah. I, I imagine that also, now I heard, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard that some of these exposures took so long that they would have to shoot the same object on the same plate night yes, after yes. night after night to get yes, the data, yes. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it was grueling. And, and you, know, you know, the, the, um, the procedure, procedure uh, at the observatory, observatory was that, uh, 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 depending on which telescope you were on, on it didn't matter, but at midnight, every, every, the work stopped, stopped and everybody, everybody went, went to the monastery for midnight supper. And the supper was, was, uh, was prepared by a cook, cook. And, and, you know, there, there was such a hierarchy, hierarchy and almost snobbery, you know, at the observatory. Because, and then also, the astronomers had to dress for work. So we're not talking to you the sweatshirts here. We're talking tweed jackets, you know, no matter how cold it was, you know, or there were snow pants, they had to look proper. And when, when they went to the monastery, and this would be a whole other talk, the, the, the ritual was that the observer on the hundred inch sat at the head of the table. That the observer on the 60 inch sat to his right, and to the right of the observer on the 60 inch was his night assistant, and to the left of the hundred inch assistant was his night assistant. And then the various people that worked at the observatory on down. The observer on the 60 inch and the observer on the hundred inch had carved napkin rings with their names on it. Oh, and wow. the rest of the staff had wooden clothespins holding their napkins. <laughs> wooden clothespins. <laughs> wooden clothespins. Yeah. Wow, that is a that is a hierarchy right there, a class yeah. structure, right? That's it. That's it. it. But 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 um, yes, but Hummison Hummison was a driving force, you know, on the mountain. And he uh, took place for a little Shapley, and he recommended, like I said, Shapley recommended him to hail. And so this is pretty great because I told you that eventually Hudson became 
the director of the Mount Wilson Observatory. This is Alfred Palmer. But he had been described as a mule driver, a fisherman, a cusser, a drinker, a poker player, a raconteur, a rake, a rogue, a gentleman, and a friend. And he was called the Renaissance Man of the San Gabriel Mountain Range. Oh, wow. And, 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 and I don't, don't think, think a person with Thomason's background could become the director of an observatory today. today. So, so probably not. Probably and, not. Yeah, you got an eighth grade uh, uh, education, um, janitor, uh, know how to run mules. Um, I don't know. You know. Yeah, you're a good ast you're a good astrophotographer, but I don't know that that's going to cut it. You know, yeah. so, but, but uh, it was, it, 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 because, it, it, because back, go ahead, so. Go I was going to say, he really, he really knew, knew the observatory inside, inside and out. He knew what it took to run it. He knew the electrical system. system. He, he knew, knew every single, single so when he told me you were his janitor, he said, oh, this is great. Because it's just like if you start out to make a movie, if you worked as a grip, you know what I mean, or the golfer, you learn every part of that industry. And then you know who to hire, who not to hire, and, and you know, I think, I think Elon, Elon Musk is kind of great in this respect. respect. Elon, Elon Musk um, has, has a very broad background for what he does, and he's, he's not a micromanager, which has not been the case all the time of observatories. So Elon, Elon Musk is so smart, he knows what he doesn't, doesn't know. know. Yeah. And he has he the bank book to hire the people that, that do. do. Yeah. You know, so, so that's pretty great. Not all the time we have that, that you know, in the, um, what do we call the staffing of an observatory. That's, that's how smart he is. So, yes. Yes. you know, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But, but, wonderful, but, but, wonderful. But, 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 so. Mount Wilson, Wilson is, is magical. magical. Yes. Mount Wilson is, and like, like I said, if, if you come in the 60 inch, inch and you have an acoustic guitar, guitar the acoustics are, are so fantastic in the dome. dome. Can you imagine looking at the Orion and Nebula with somebody playing an acoustic guitar in the background? Right. right. Yeah. Now, now you, you have told me stories. I, I, I mean, maybe you can't say who's been in there. Maybe they don't, they don't want, but, uh, or maybe you can. Who, what, what have your other experiences have been like at uh, Mount Wilson? Well, I mean, what, 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 what one of the, the greatest experiences, experiences I and mean, one of the experiences, experiences that thrilled me was mm -hmm. we had the, the, the Dawn, Dawn team come to the mountain, mountain right? The Dawn. They had they already, already uh, you know, set an investor, and, and they were okay. on their oh. way to series. The mission and, team, and, yeah. And, and they had never seen them, and, and they, they could, could see those dots through the 60 inch. inch. Yes. So, so that, that was the thrill. We're showing, you know, the engineers, the astronomers from JPL, the objects that they had already sent the spacecraft to because their map was so good, but they never saw it. That's amazing. <laughs> That's you know? amazing. That's amazing. And we just have another group that has, that has come that is so much fun. And they're the Psyche 16, 16, 16 team. So they're sitting, you know, the spacecraft to the metal asteroid Psyche 16. Right. So, so they, they got to see the, the spot through the city. That's awesome. So, <laughs> that but is awesome. So the the um, people from all over the world come. So, so celebrities will come, and, and after they see the star, calling them a star has a whole other meaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> you, become, you become humble. You know, you know, and, and you and, and you are seeing a part of yourself. yourself. That's, That's what's so amazing, right? right about us doing this. We are looking at ourselves. Yeah. No, this is that is amazing. All these parts for us, Ron, right there, right there now. You know, yeah. so that's great. Yeah. Great. yeah. So I mean, we've had rock bands. We've had. Oh, this, oh, this was, was really, really great. great. You know, we, we use red lights, lights yeah. in the yeah. dome when, when the light goes out. So I once had a rock. Robert, it was his birthday, okay. and his wife was a set designer. And when, and when I said you could only use red, we only use red lights in the dome, yeah, yeah. she went in and got red crystal blue oh, wow. lamps. And put them all over the dome. I mean, it was fantastic. You know, they were rocking, they all came in black. You know, we had the music droning. 
and it was great. Wow. And it was those great. dumb walls would talk. That's awesome. Well, they are talking to you, Shelley, so that's awesome. Uh, you're on this last slide right now. It show, it's a black and white sh mm -hmm. slide showing the 60 inch, probably not long after it was finished. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is this large thing kind of sticking up from the top. I, I imagine that's a spectrograph. Yeah. Um, right? So they, they yeah. were taking spectra with the 60 inch. Sure. Uh, and I've heard that this telescope is, was the prototype for all modern telescopes manufactured, or, you know, large observatory telescopes made today. And probably a lot of amateur telescopes have been borrowed from this as well, so. And, you know, it's a thrill because um, we can show people the mirror, of course, was made on French, uh, French champagne bottle glass. Yes. Right? Glass from the sand, glass from the sand. Why did they use that? Because at the time, that was the only substance that they knew that would be able to take 60 inches in diameter, you know. So um, we can shine the light there and show you the green champagne bottle. They can't drink champagne, but can show you the glass. It's pretty great. And we, we, we illuminize the mirror about every two years. Uh -huh. And it's, it's just oh, the, the telescope is in great shape. And, and uh, so every year, the last well, not every year, but... Uh, the last last year and this year, and I plan to do it next year. Uh, we're hosting the 60 inch star party, and uh, uh, so the um, the 60 inch star party. Uh, you attended the first one that we did, uh, and I thought that was awesome because yeah. Shelley, you know so much about this telescope and everything. And normally you would be the you know one of the people running the session, but uh, you actually yeah. got to be an observer. Uh, with yeah, us, was which was fabulous. <laughs> and, um, and, and I have to tell you, you know, we are so grateful for all of the things that you have given Mount Wilson, you know, to improve the seeing, all of the equipment, you know, and how you have supported us for all these years. Oh, I think we would not be able to do a lot of the things we do without your support. And I thank you for that personally. Thank you. You're thank you. amazing. No. <laughs> You know, to be able to participate in the little tiny way that I've been able to, it, it's it's uh, it, it's it's been incredible. You know, we have eyepieces up there. We have our ED one twenty seven refractor used as a relay scope, so you can actually look through the hundred inch. You know, hundred inch. Right? Yeah, that is yeah. that was that's amazing because I'm trying to think. The first time I looked through the hundred inch was or tried to look through the hundred inch was at the groundbreaking for Chara. Okay. And um, and so we had to look through the Kude focus, you know, and it was like, and it was Jupiter, and it was like, <laughs> and you know, you want to be thrilled. Could you do that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> you know what that looks like. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So you know, wow. Well, it, uh, the views I saw through it were, I mean, it was spectacular. We're looking at planetary nebula, and you can see color. Uh, my best color. views of Saturn and Mars have been through that 60-inch telescope, so. Well, that's what changed my life. Yeah. I looked at, through the 60-inch telescope at Saturn. I was not into astronomy other than I knew the constellations, you know, because my dad had been a navigator, and he mm -hmm. taught me them. But I looked through the 60-inch at Saturn, and I burst out crying. And I thought, what is it? And the people were saying, don't get the eyepiece wet, get off the ladder. You know right. I mean? But I wanted to know, why is it like that? It, and why I cried was, I, it was a great night. It looked exactly how you would have imagined it looked. Right. And I, and I said to myself, wow, I wonder if I saw it edge on, if my life would have gone in this direction. You know what I mean? But it was wide open. The rings were wide open. It was really it was almost arc second. It was all meant to happen. Yeah. One of those magical Mount Wilson nights. Yes. With great seeing, and it really humbles you. It does. It really. That's very true. That's very true. And you can never, I mean, I have never not caught myself looking up since then. You right. know, just curious. Even like I said last time, I study clouds, I study the sky. I'm looking up and I'm looking down because you know, because. I have an explore scientific microscope that you do. Now, I've been looking at tardigrades. 
I haven't seen them on the moon, but I have seen them through oh, my microscope. Well. How are your tardigrades doing? Doing pretty well, I guess, huh? They're, they're yeah, they indestructible, would. so... You they're know. fantastic. Yeah, that's They great. are. It's, it was so thrilling when I actually saw them, you know, when I focused and I said, they're really there. Yeah, that's what they look like. Oh, look <laughs> at them, did I leave a sticker on, you know what I mean, that right. had that picture in there? That's no, right. it was fabulous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll have to have a presentation on your microscope and the tardy grades and stuff. The so. tardy grades. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Uh, anything else you want to add about uh, Mount Wilson? Uh, um, well, uh, yes. Now yes. On there, the there's a lot more to hear about Mount Wilson and what went on in the culture of Mount Wilson. Mm -hmm. And I hope we can tell those stories. But what I'd like to add is... Hmm, I would like to add an invitation for people to come up and look through the 60 inch and yes. the 100 inch telescope. And so that you know, uh, you would actually wind up contacting me. I'm, I am the telescope coordinator. You'd fill out a form. Right. Um, of course, we charge for it, but every penny is worth it. Oh, yeah. You know, um, yeah. And so we have 25 people that are able to look through the 60 inch and uh, 20 that can be on the observing floor, you know, on the bull ring of the 100 inch. Right. And it's an incredible It, it will change experience. your life, that's true. Yeah, it will. and if you don't want to rent the whole session, you can uh, attend one of our events and just buy, buy a ticket and uh, come along. So, but um, thanks very much, Shelly. It was great. Thank you. Yeah, and we're going mm -hmm. to uh, close out now. So thank you very much, guys. We'll see you on the next Scott and Space Show with Scott and Shelly. Bye. Bye. <laughs>